darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you so here I am to worship here I Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship. And as we opened worshiping and saying, here I am to worship, I want to bow down. I want to see you. I want to hear you. I want to sense your presence. I think it was that kind of a posture that Paul must have been in when God gave him these words through the Holy Spirit. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons Neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's why we worship our great God. We know he's with us wherever we go, and he's with us right now. And the Father greets his children. He knows each of us by name. Grace to you and peace from me, your dad, Abba, through Jesus Christ, my Son, your Savior, through the very power of the Holy Spirit who has set up residence in your heart, makes your heart the home where I reside, does a shaping work of your character and comes upon you in power to be my witnesses, grace and peace to you. And all God's people said, amen. If you take a moment, greet a few people that maybe you didn't come with this morning, we'll continue. Oh, really? 
pour out our praise to you because your grace is enough and you are our hope no matter what and we thank you that we can lean on you and look to you and you're right there you're watching out for us you're the one who fills us jo with joy and with peace in the midst of whatever we face and we want to thank you that you've been with us as church this week you've been with the steenwick family and you're with the gears family as they celebrate life that has been well lived and grieve the loss of the walking, talking relationships that we have. And we thank you that you're the hope of all of those that we lift up in prayer throughout the week for Colton and the needs that he has been experiencing and for Art and Marion and Les and Lori and Joe and Sharon and Pete. And Lord, the list goes on. You know what our needs are and you meet every one of them through Jesus Christ. That's the promise you give to us. And we know that as we step out each day to follow you, that we will not be shaken by whatever happens because you are our hope, the God of hope. We pray that you would fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you so that we, each one of us, incorporately may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and not be shaken. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next song, I believe, is a new one to Emmanuel here, but um, I think you'll catch on quite quickly, so I invite you to uh, listen and join in as you feel comfortable.
You may be seated. Thank you, Nate and friends, for leading us in worship. So good to have you here this morning. We're going to continue focusing on Jesus in this season of Lent. And uh, in the past few weeks, we've been taking a look at the words of Jesus in those I am statements that are spoken and remembered by John as he records them along the way. And what hit me again this week as I'm reading through the passage and kind of simmering, letting it soak in, is that it's not like when we read a book and we read it one time and it's like, well, now we've read that book and we're done with it. Or we hear a story one time and it's like, well, now I know that story. When we read these words of Jesus, these are words, it wasn't like somebody was there recording them in shorthand so we'd get them word for word, boom, right there, and we could quick put together a blog and send them out or we could text them to somebody or take a little recording of Jesus and send it off and all at once everybody would have the words of Jesus. But they were words that I believe Jesus spoke again and again. That as he ministered and as he spoke and as he taught, he would repeat them and the people would begin to catch it and as the Holy Spirit led John to write these words that we're going to read in just a moment in, in John chapter 10, that these were words that became a part of the oral tradition of handing it down to those who followed you. And it's how they remembered because they didn't have Bibles to carry with them or iPhones to go to and quick catch a passage that must have come up at some point. And it was something that they would hold on deeply. It was in their heart. It's the stuff that pops up that you remember because it's deeply embedded. And that's what I see here as we take a look at this teaching that Jesus speaks to those who are following him. And in particular, it's here that the Pharisees have been challenging him and they're wondering what Jesus is going to say next, and they're out there to pin him to the wall and put him to death, and Jesus is right there to be the light of the world that he spoke of as we heard it last week and a couple of weeks before that, the bread of life. If you eat of me, you never go hungry. You never be thirsty. I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you never walk in darkness. You don't walk in darkness, but you have the light of life. Do they really... Uh, several scenes that show up. One, one of them simply overall is about sheep and shepherds and where they live and how that all intertwines with a gate and a good shepherd and then about those who aren't in the fold. And that's why I've moved with the direction of gates and shepherds and I was going to call it fold of sheep, but everybody belongs to a fold. It just might not be the fold of Jesus. And so other folds is really where I've gone toward the ending here. John chapter 10, if you would follow me along and we'll be digging into this passage, the first 21 verses. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. And the man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. 
I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, He is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Sheep, so much a part of Israel's history. Reference to sheep and shepherds embedded throughout the prophecies and throughout the Psalms. Psalm 100, know that the Lord is God, it's he who made us, we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture, and so we belong to the fold. And the fold in reference here is the fold of Judaism, where people of Israel will call the sheep of God. And so as Jesus is teaching here, he's beginning to have them understand that he is the one they have been looking for. He's the Messiah. He's the hope of this tribe, of this people called Israel. And he's come to fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament. And here's Jesus in reference to himself using words again that trigger them back to the Old Testament, that trigger them back to the words of God saying, I am, and here's Jesus again, almost a blasphemy to them, that he's claiming to really be God. And how can this be? And they're in confusion, and they're trying to figure out what's going on here, because they've never seen anybody heal a blind man before. They've never seen the lame walk. They've never seen what Jesus was doing as he proclaimed good news and then lived good news out. So Jesus is trying to use pictures from their life and from where they live, and it's hard for us to grasp because it was such a different culture. And and really, when we begin to look at even the gate, and you begin to look at the beginning of the story here, there are a couple of really pictures of those places where the sheep would be. And there are, when we look at the gates, entrances and exits to two different kinds of sheepfolds. One of the kind of sheepfolds was the kind that you're going to find in the city or the village. So you're out tending your sheep and you're taking care of them and you're looking for that next green pasture. And if any of you have been to Israel, it shocked me. I'm thinking we're going to land and there are going to be these nice, great, big green fields and the little woolies are just hanging out like they do in the places where I've seen great big groups of sheep out there. And you get out there in the wilderness and in the desert and in the heart of Israel, and it isn't that way at all. It's dry land. There's these dirt paths going along with a little bit of grass along the edge, brown grass mostly, until you get really close. And you can just see on the very top a little bit of green And the green is there in this dry country, especially in the summertime, the months of dryness. The green is there because of the moisture that comes every night off the humidity humidity from, from the Mediterranean Sea. And the job of the shepherd is to bring the sheep to green pastures, these little tufts of green along the path, and let them eat just so much because if they eat it all the way down to the root, they'll destroy it and it'll never come back. And so they keep the sheep moving. That's why they were such a mobile people having to move around because you just can't let them eat up a field and destroy it and then destroy it and destroy it. And there would be no green pastures in their mind as to what a green pasture was. And here's Jesus thinking about how the shepherds move. And from time to time, they come to a town or a village. And when they get to the town or the village, 
there's a big sheep fold that they can all bring their sheep. And they might, one have 10, and might have 20, and one might have 30, and however many they have, they bring it to the sheep fold of the village or the town. And in that village or in that town, somebody would watch over the sheep at night and the shepherds would take their turns, but they would have a break from that day-to-day grind of watching over their sheep. But there would be a gate. There would be a way into the sheepfold and there would be a way out of the sheepfold. And once the sheep went in, I mean, to me, it was clarified when I went to Jordan and we went to the city of Petra and we were up on the mountainside looking down at the valley where the city of Petra was off to the north and there was a great big sheepfold with thousands of sheep in it where shepherds had brought their sheep for whether it be a night or two or for a week, I don't know how long, and they were fed while they were there by a meal that was brought in, the grass or the hay, but this was their place of safety, and the shepherd would leave the sheep there coming through that one gate, and the sheep would only leave when the shepherd came back. So we got there just before dusk at night, and our rabbi said to us, let's just watch this for a while, and he read some of the story from the Old Testament and here from the New Testament in reference as he was doing some teaching. And he said, now, we're going to come back tomorrow morning, and we're going to get here by the time most of the shepherds have taken their sheep out, and we're going to watch what happens. And so we were up early that next morning by 6, 6.30. We were up on the side of the mountain, and the shepherds started to come one by one. And, and they would come, and they would make a specific noise. And sometimes it was a voice. Sometimes it was just kind of a click, click with their tongue. And they would maybe make a motion at the same time. And all at once, whoever their sheep was or were, they would leave the rest of the flock, and they would join with the shepherd. And it was, ama- it was like a miracle. It was amazing. I wish I had a video of it. Just to watch how they'd make the sound 10 sheep here, 30 sheep here, 50 sheep here, and they would separate out because they heard the voice of the one who was their shepherd and they trusted that voice and it was the only voice they were going to follow. And that was that rustic sheepfold. I mean, that city sheepfold. Then there's this rustic sheepfold. Now, Now they're out in the wilderness and they're out looking for more green grass. And another part that blew me away is when we traveled through Jordan and we saw herds of camels and herds of goats and herds of sheep, they're all talking on their mobile phones. I mean, it was like, really? This really destroys the image I have of what you do. You know, they got their staff out in one hand and their mobile phone in the other hand, and they're probably saying, got any green grass over there? How are the waters over? Are they still? You know, I don't know what they were talking about. But the reality is, at night they would rest and Along the way, they would have little sheepfolds that had been built over the years, potentially by a family that was moving along, camping out until it was time to move on before the grass was destroyed. And they would build a sheepfold made out of rocks that they would find, and they'd build a little wall. And on top of the wall, they'd find thorns, parts of bushes that were sharp, and they'd plant them around the top, almost in my mind like barbed wire, to keep out anything that would come. And there'd be one opening to which the sheep could go in and to which the sheep could go out. And at night, when all the sheep were in, the shepherd would literally lay down over the opening so nothing could come or go without the shepherd realizing that there was a sheep coming in or out, but it was really, is there any varmint coming in? Is there a wolf? Is there something coming in to destroy my sheep? And all at once, the picture starts to come alive about the sheepfold And in the one case, we've got the city picture. They hear the voice. It's amazing when you hear a voice that you recognize. You know it instantly. I've been working at the auto auction for six years now, and I think I know all 100-plus drivers, and I don't even have to, as I'm driving the van and I have all the drivers behind me, if there are 10 or 12 of them, I don't have to look at their name tags. I don't have to see them. I just hear their voice, and I know immediately who they are. And they know my voice. And I'm thinking, you know, with Jesus... They knew his voice. The disciples were spoken to and they were invited to come and follow. But here is Jesus who's saying, I'm the one who's there and I recognize 
my sheep's voice and they recognize my voice and they follow me. And I lay down my life for my sheep. Literally, he lays down in that opening and lays down his life for his sheep. So when Jesus is teaching them, I am the gate, whoever's entered through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go out. There's safety about coming in and coming out. It comes through Jesus Christ. Anybody who enters is going to be saved. And by entering through Christ, there's the penalty of sin that is taken care of. Death is no more. It's what Paul was capturing in Romans chapter 3 when he said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That would be everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. And in the same breath, they're also justified freely by the grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And what strikes me about that is, as you look at all the Scriptures, Jesus did not come begrudgingly as the shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep or as the gate through which they could come. He came willingly. There was a joy about coming. In fact, the writer of Hebrews captures it in chapter 12, verse 3. He says, you know, keep your eyes focused on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And the joy wasn't his sin because there wasn't any. It was because he was paying the price for our sin. And he is the way in. There is no other way. It's only Jesus. We're going to look at that in greater depth a little bit later in the series about Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. But I just Googled for a moment this week the words, what are the ways to Jesus? And it was amazing how many pages showed up. I tired real quickly, and it didn't take long to get past the pages that were written by Christians into all the other ways to Jesus, all the multiple ways to whatever you need to find, and it doesn't even have to be Jesus. And it's like, really? It's pretty clear, and it's what Jesus is speaking of. I am the gate I am the way in and out. I know my sheep, they know me. I know your voice, you know mine. And I even know your name. I even know who you are. So there is this being saved, but there's also this safe. We can come in and we can go out. If the door was closed to a city, you knew you better not go in and out because there was danger and they were keeping out whatever the danger would be. If the shepherd was laying in the opening of the sheepfold, it meant there was no going in and going out. But when the opening was there, then the reality is you can come in and you can go out and you can find pasture. You can go eat. You can go enjoy. You can go be satisfied. And you can be safe. You can be safe in your coming in and your going out. And through Jesus, we are saved. Despite what the enemy tries to do in this in-between time, the battle of light and darkness as we saw it last week, despite all the accusations of the enemy, despite all the deceit of the enemy and all the temptations that are there of the enemy, with Jesus, he is there protecting through the Holy Spirit. He's watching out for us. He's giving us words of discernment and knowledge and wisdom. And he gives us his word that he gives instruction and he speaks to our hearts within the context of our prayer time and our worship time and within the context of community. And not only are we going to be safe, but we're going to be satisfied. I, I love that. We're going to be satisfied. I, I think we live in a culture that has no clue what satisfaction is. Whatever you have, there's something else you want. Does anybody else relate to that? Is that just me? And, and the older I get, I try to let go of that, but there's always something else. There's something a little bit better. You know, a 2019 Silverado would be so much better than a 2018, even though they're brand new and they don't have any miles on them because there's something new about it. There's something else they put in it. And it's like we have this hunger and this thirst, and we're always dissatisfied. You go to a restaurant and you go there one time and it's an incredible meal and you can't wait to go back. The service was wonderful. The food was tender. It was juicy. And I won't talk about it too much more because it's getting close to noon. But the reality is you might go back the next time and be totally disappointed. 
And then it's like, I gotta find the next restaurant that's really good. I gotta find the next food that's really good. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, writes David. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. That's that part deep inside that gets dissatisfied really quickly. But he's right there to restore when we go wandering off and find in our own place. And even further, the sheep are known by Jesus. Verse 29, which we didn't read of chapter 10 here, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And I and the father are one. And this is why the shepherd dies. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. I mean, you talk about intimacy here. Incredible when you start to look at the shepherds, how the Lord knows his sheep. He leads them. He is the good shepherd. He knows every one of them. They know him. They know the sound of his voice. It's an incredible sound to hear that voice. And and it's not just the words that are spoken. It's the tone of the words. Isn't that tone really important? I mean, I told you about our puppy dog. You probably get tired of it along the way, but he's just this mischievous 10-month-old cocker spaniel who loves mischief, and yet there's this side of him that is incredibly obedient. But, you know, you just play with words a little bit. So the other day I was sitting down with Charlie, and Charlie was on my lap, and I petting him and he's just soaking it in he loves it, his belly gets scratched along the way, he's just relaxed I'm saying, oh Charlie you're the most ugly dog I've ever known you know, and just speaking in a soft voice, his tail's wagging away you know, you know, so a little bit later, I got into this other mood and I'm saying Charlie I love you, and his tail goes between his legs and he hunches down because it was the tone of voice And the shepherd knows us and where we're at. And he speaks to us and he speaks with a tone of grace and of love and with hope to guide us and to lead us and to show us his way. And he knows our name. He knows who we are. He calls his sheep. He says, come, and they come, and instantly they're there. When I was in Israel, man, we kept right on the tail of our rabbi. Our rabbi said, you follow me. That means you get within a foot of me, and you almost get kicked by me because you're so close to me. And there would be a line of 22 of us walking through Israel and through Jordan, and when the, when the rabbi said, come, that's all he had to say, and you better get there. Or he'd say, come. But there could be an intensity or there could just be a calmness, but there was a ripe moment and we weren't going to miss it and we weren't going to get abandoned out there by ourselves. And he calls his sheep. He did that with Matthew. He said, follow me. And Matthew recognized, followed. He did it with Zacchaeus. Come on down, hurry, I'm going to your house tonight. And Zacchaeus jumped on down and went to his house and met with Jesus that night. And it's Philip. I mean, Jesus actually goes into Galilee and he seeks out Philip because Philip needs to be a follower here. And Lazarus, come out. Talk about sheep knowing the name of Jesus. I think about Mary Magdalene visiting the tomb on the morning of the resurrection day. And she gets there and she's been weeping and she's been mourning and grieving because Jesus has died and her hope has been lost in terms of who he'd been with her, the real person. And thinking that this figure that she sees is the gardener, she hears his voice. Mary. And the response is simply, teacher. Rabboni, she knows who he is. And so we listen for his voice. We want to hear his voice. When you open the word, I mean, I've taught you over the last 10 months I've been here again and again, and you probably get tired. It's like, doesn't he know anything else? Doesn't, doesn't he have any other lens into Scripture? But I think it's maybe just with aging. It's just simplicity. When I open the word and wherever I'm at, What is God saying to me today? Come, Holy Spirit, will you speak to me today? And it's amazing how he speaks and shows up in places I would have never figured. 
given my life circumstances, given where I'm at in that day, a word that I think I need that word, or the word comes and it's like, I can't forget that word. And later in the day, I'm in a relationship with somebody and that word, boom, is right back there. And it's like, you got to share that word with that person right now. That's Jesus doing his work through his Holy Spirit as the good shepherd who leads us, knows our name. And as Jesus leads us, He leads us from anything that would endanger us to find the green pastures. He leads us to anything that would distract us or would blind us to the truth. And we live in a culture that is so full of the lack of truth. It's amazing what people believe in and what they're searching for. And it doesn't take long to rub shoulders with them and to run into them. And we'll expand on that a little bit in a couple of weeks when we look at the way, the truth, and the life. But we can worship stuff. Like, you know, do I really need to get a text message moment by moment, all the stock market is doing every day to kind of decide how my emotions are going to be that today? Where am I putting my hope? Do I really need to... You know, worship knowledge. I think I love knowing stuff. I love learning stuff. I'm constantly Googling stuff. It drives people nuts. Siri, will you tell me this? Because I like to know. But after a while, does Siri become who I am worshiping? Does Siri, whether I pick the male voice or the female voice, replace the God that I have my hope in and where real knowledge comes? I want knowledge of God and our walk together to be His Word to me. And I also need to understand that being in the sheepfold is not about me. And being in the sheepfold is not about us. It is being about us in terms of being the community of believers, but the community of believers is sent out, and the community of believers is sent out because, in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. Now, I don't claim to know everything there is to know about predestination and election. I know there's a lot in the Scriptures. I had to study a lot of it. I had to learn a lot of it. And my bottom line as I walked away again is very, very simple. It's simply only God knows that. But every person I look at, every person I meet, every person I lay my eyes on who doesn't appear to be on the flock side that I'm a part of or in the pen that I'm a part of, potentially might be and I don't need to know that I just need to be there to represent the reality of God and his grace and the ministry of reconciliation that's given to us as new creatures in Christ Jesus who become ambassadors of reconciliation 2 Corinthians 5 17 18 19 20 powerful and Jesus is pointing out right here, there are other sheep not of this fold. And that had to be a word that for Judaism, it was like, really, for the leaders? Only the Jews are in the fold. There can't be anybody else other than those who ethnically are Jews. This is heresy. This is the kind of stuff we can put you to death for. You're speaking something that's totally outside of the bonds that we would say is okay. And here's Jesus saying, there's other sheep not of this fold. And and look through the book of Acts. You study through the book of Acts and you watch how the church unfolds beginning into Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And you look at the conflict in the early church. The conflict was when other people than Jews started to become believers, what do we do with them? Because they don't seem to fit the flock. And yet they're a part of the flock. And so they have councils that meet and try to make decisions. And, you know, Peter has this vision to go to Cornelius' house, and he goes because Cornelius had a vision to send for Peter, and he gets there, and he proclaims the good news. And Cornelius and his whole household is gathered together, this general, this soldier, this leader, and all of his family believes, and the gifts are poured out, and miracles begin to happen, and they've never been to a Jewish synagogue And Peter's in deep trouble. And he gets back to the church. And the church is questioning him and challenging him on what in the world were you doing? And it's like, I can't help it. The Spirit was at work. Amazing when you watch how it unfolds. And so we're invited in our lives, in the places where God has us, places that 
you will go, I'll never get to go, and I don't need to go there because you get to go there. People you're going to meet. I saw a stat the other day that said that any person probably over a lifetime is going to impact a minimum of 10,000 other people. Minimum. And I'm thinking, man, if there are 100 of us, think about how many lives are impacted by the lives that we get to speak of and share and the good news that we get to share. And it's really good news because Jesus, who is the gate to the sheepfold, is also the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep and actually becomes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Incredible how that all unfolds. And so here we are as we celebrate Lent and we hear from Jesus speaking about who he is. And the invitation, I believe, for us is who are the people in our lives that God would have us pay attention to? That the Holy Spirit is highlighting and saying, here's a person of peace. Even if you have to give up a relationship over here to make room over here, and that's always the tension in our today's culture, Lord God, will you give me the grace to speak with that friend and to say, I need some space right now because we're on the same page about Jesus. But I've got to spend some time over here. And then I listened to Jesus in Luke chapter 15, 1 through 7, and, and here's this story of 99 sheep and one sheep is lost. Now, you know, in Western civilization, you wouldn't go hunting for that one sheep and abandon the other nine and maybe even have them in danger of having wolves and wild animals come and eat them up and be harassed and helpless. But Jesus pursues in the story, the shepherd goes after the one who is lost because the other 99 are in the fold. And so I keep asking when I look at that, Lord God, who's the one in my life? Who is that person who's a part of another fold, meaning not Jesus, that I get to share the good news with? That is so much better than any other good news that I can share with them. So much better than anything I can tell them about the 2019 Silverado. So much better than I can tell them about the new iPhone or the new computer or whatever it may be that attracts us and grabs hold of us or whatever the new teaching is that, you know, it really doesn't matter who you believe in it. Just have to believe and wait for the stars to line up and then just listen and feel it. The reality is we have Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, the good shepherd the gate to the sheepfold, and we get, listen to this in verse 10, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. So this thought in conclusion, life to the full doesn't mean, oh good, when I die I get to go to heaven. I think that's really good news. I think it's incredible news. But it's, it's, this is probably a really bad analogy, but it's like when you live your whole life waiting for retirement, and when you get to retirement, things are really going to be good, and so you just endure life until you get to retirement. And the reality is we get life now. We get a taste of the kingdom now. The life that Jesus is, and you may have life and have it to the full, isn't simply down the road. It's right now. And he gives us all the fruit of the Spirit. The love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the loving kindness and the faithfulness and the gentleness and the kindness and the self-control. He gives us gifts of the Spirit, a mix within the body, and we need each other. We need apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers we need people who are able to hear words of knowledge and people who are able to speak wisdom into those words of knowledge. It's a part of being in community and it's a part of life to the full. And God will do that work in us. And I believe the heartbeat of it all isn't just so that we feel good and take up space. It's so that we may be used as his ambassadors of good news because he has works that he prepared in advance for us to be engaged in. And those works that he prepared in advance for us to do are works we get to step in now individually and corporately and know the Good Shepherd is with you. Know that he's watching out for you. Know that he has a plan for you. Know that you are a child of God and the inheritance is yours 
and you're no longer slaves to the enemy, Romans chapter 8, but you are children of God. May you experience the fullness of life in Jesus now and forever, and may we experience that together with great joy as we go out with joy to be his ambassadors of grace and peace and love. Amen? So, Lord God, thank you for sending your Son, the Word become flesh and dwelling among us. Thank you that when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, that it was purpose to reveal yourself to us to show us your great love, to walk with us hand in hand, to equip us for such a time as this, 2,000 years later, to equip us. And we pray that if we haven't stepped into the fold, today might be a day we would step into the fold The invitation has been there, Lord God, to come and follow. And your voice has been there. And I pray that you would come through your Holy Spirit and do an inside work that would be met by the invitation. Why don't we follow Jesus together? And together we'd grow up into him who is our head, Jesus Christ, with the mission right on the forefront of our hearts and minds every day. Come, Lord Jesus, do your work. May it be to your glory. May it be for the coming of the kingdom. May it be for the great joy that was set before you in which you endured the cross that we would find the freedom that is ours through Christ Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, rise in body or in spirit as we uh, respond with I surrender all.
You may be seated. I'd like to ask the deacons to come forward to take our offering. And Lord God, we do surrender all to you, not just the resource, but the resource saying to you, we recognize, God, it's all yours, all we have. The physical stuff in our lives, the material stuff, the air we breathe, the giftedness that you've given to us, the places of work, our friendships, our neighborhoods, the places where we do business, Lord, it's all a part of the world you've placed us in. And we surrender to you all that we have for the purpose that you've created us, for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We just thank God for the praise team today for leading us. Thank you so much. Would you stand with me as you receive God's parting blessing and then we'll sing one more song. So may the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.
go in peace to love and serve the Lord.